Okay, so thanks to those of you that are returning from the last time we came together with the first part of this seminar, Developing Peaceful Individuals and Community Builders. And we're glad to be back with you again today. So it'll be Jen and myself again. And we're going to do part two today. And so hi, for those of you that are new, I'm Judith Lumen, and I'm the director of Duhovka Montessori um, Teacher Education Program. And I um, was in the, worked in the Czech Republic for 10 years, and now I'm in Warsaw, Poland, and I'm the head of school at Warsaw Montessori School. And my name is Jennifer Varbanov, and I work as the early childhood director for Dehovka Montessori Training Education Program, and also as the academic director here in Norway, uh, where I live, um, academic director for a children's house for a zero to six program. So we ended the last presentation by showing you the Flower of Peace model by Sunny McFarlane. So the beginning of our work, we, we talked about theory, and I hope everybody who was not with us last time has had an opportunity to see the recording from last time because it really builds that foundation. Um, so this is from Sunny McFarlane, and this model was developed by her discussing the four lobes that come together to create the spirit of the individual. So each of us need to understand and to work to develop ourselves and our inner spirit for overall peace and just understanding what that is. We all have to learn to, to work on that, to look at each of these areas and develop them in our own lives so that we can help the children uh, that we work with. So this is the work that we have with the children, whether they're our own children or whether they're the children in our classrooms that we work with each day. We work to cultivate the awareness in each of these four areas, and these are the things we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the flower of peace model, sometimes it can feel a bit abstract when we're looking at building self-awareness or community awareness, global awareness, environmental awareness. So what we need to do or what we work to do is to break down these um, large areas into smaller areas and looking at um, each each circle as a whole, for example, self-awareness, but also what is the relationship of self-awareness to community awareness? All of these elements together um, are working to build up that spirit of the child. And we, in our Montessori environments, already include so many factors that Montessori um, that Montessori knew, it was just amazing that she knew so many areas that were working on the whole child, because it's not just about presenting a lesson, it's about the entire feeling and experience that the child has in the environment. So when we look at self-awareness, um, we are helping the child with all of that character building that they're doing by really exploring and discovering and stretching boundaries, trying new things um, and working to achieve. So there are many moments in these pictures here. Um, these are children that are out on a trip. They're learning how to use knives. We have children, uh, the smallest, the toddler here that is walking up a, a steep set of, set of stairs. Um, the child in the ski picture, that was her first time on skis. And so just stretching those boundaries and, um, and trying new things, you know, that's a big part of becoming self-aware. Uh, in this picture, the children are learning for the first time how to do ice fishing and all of the steps of that, something that they had maybe never done before. Some of them maybe had done before, um, but just stretching the boundaries to try and see the different activities that they can do. So a lot of the time you'll notice that with self-awareness, it's not only what's happening inside of the environment, but often our connection with nature and making that relationship. That the more connections that we have with nature and the more aware we become of how close we are, um, the more self-aware we also become. I think that when you talk about the self-awareness, it's important for all of us to just consider as Montessorians, oftentimes um, 
when we take children out or we have events that they attend or we take them to, our first response can be one within ourselves. It's that fear of, no, we can't do that or no, they can't do that. And we have to work on that ourselves because we have to trust in the child with the things that we let them experience and let them um, really take that risk, which, so when we're moving into this character bu building, we are working towards helping them to push their limits. Um, stepping out of the box is a, a great way to think about it. So they have to take risks within what we consider a managed environment. So we know that we're going to take them out um, here. They're in a canoe or I could have, I've had children on the beach and we took them seining where they have these huge nets and they're wading out in the water where it's up to their shoulders. But as the adult, you have this fear of, oh, it might be too deep or maybe they can't pull the net or it's, it's a lot, but you have to step back and let them have that experience. Um, because this is how their character is built. It's by every experience that helps them feel success. So often we use team building with our children or with adults um, to help build that sense of trust. And after the child gets that trust, develops that trust, then the more opportunity they have to push the limits and to take those risks, if they trust the adults they're with or their peers, they will continue to do that. And then again, it's a cycle. They're becoming um, stronger and more self-confident in what they're doing. They're willing to take the risk that will give them the strength that they need um, to find out who they are and actually what their limits are. Mm -hmm. And it is that prepared environment, like you said. And outdoors is... Um, the ideal prepared environment for the child. It's just so important that the adult gives that opportunity and also prepares for the safety around um, each situation. One of the things I want to go back to that, Jen, and I think about um, just recently um, in my office, and some of my teachers are on here, a little boy came running in with a spider, a spider in a cup, you know, and, you know, I am terrified of spiders. Like, I don't like spiders. So, but he came running in with this spider, so excited. He has this pet spider. He's going to go catch him some food and take care of the spider. So I had to just swallow my own thoughts and fear about the spider because I am a Montessorian, but spiders aren't my thing. So I just said, wow, that's a really lovely spider, but how are we going to take care of this spider? So he gave me his story on how, what he was going to feed. I said, mm -hmm. You know, don't you think the spider would be most successful in its life if we return it to nature? So we had a big conversation and then he went and found a very safe spot to release that spider. So it's about allowing that experience, even though I had that fear. So I guess when I say we have to think about those things, I didn't respond with this, oh no, it's a spider type thing. Um, so taking responsibility. If children are given the opportunities to actually be responsible, so I say that in quotes, actually be responsible, um, they will step up and take responsibility. Elementary um, children actually need to be trusted. Again, there's a lot of trust that comes from you uh, by the adult that they can do it and they can be responsible. So with this opportunity, they can and they will fill the need, but only if they're allowed. So as the adult in the environment, I challenge you to go back and to think about everything that you do every day in your classroom. And think about, could a child do some of these things? Could a child take care of taking attendance every day. Um, could a child get tea or juice and bring it to the classroom if they already aren't doing that? What could the child actually do? 
free yourself up and accept and trust that they can do it because then that responsibility becomes theirs and they feel good about it. But it comes from us as the adults as to giving them that responsibility. They will feel empowered. Um, so I, I challenge you to think about what you can relinquish or um, allow the child to take over and then see what happens. The more you give for them, the more they will ask and do. And in taking responsibility, the children are also experiencing grace and courtesy. Um, this We are talking about self-awareness right now, but each of these um, events, for example, that are in the pictures are practical life activities that are also caring for the community. So when they are building themselves, they're also working towards the community. And uh, in this particular, in this particular um, trip, the children also made their shopping list, made the budget, and the children in this picture are between five and six. And so organizing the tent, preparing everything, cleaning everything, cooking, um, having to care that it's a very hot pan. Uh, all of these elements are so important for their, for their development, but also that the adult, like Judy says, let's go. The adult has to give, uh, um, give up that control need. And that's something that we all need to work on so that the um, children can take responsibility and have that opportunity. So in our process of aiding towards um, character building and really reaching out and trying um, challenging things, we're also showing a feeling of love and appreciation and connectedness. It's gratitude. And so this is something that is one of those unquantifiable um, parts that we talked about last time is that gratitude. How do we share that? How do we feel that? Um, in the um, photo on the top that we have an elementary child helping an early childhood child um, learn how to um, use the brakes and how to dog sled. There are so many events that you could be doing wherever you live that are connecting the child to nature, but also the whole series. So in a practical sense, how we do that is we introduce the child in a multidisciplinary way to this, um, to this particular sport. And so the children are learning first care of the dog, care of the animal. So they're following all the way through from the year before when the puppies are born in the springtime, usually. So they're able to have a visit and then they're seeing and learning each of the parts of the sport. So we see that this is um, first care of the animal and how to treat an animal, what their needs are, um, the, the life cycle of the animal. Um, also, when it comes to introducing the sport, um, they're learning, um, they have three part cards that are talking about all the different language and nomenclature with the sport. And so each step of the way, they're including science, we're including language, practical life, all of these elements come together to give a holistic learning and also show our connectedness to other living um, creatures or animals. So this was, uh, this is a very successful project, but there are many projects that you can do on all different levels, um, including nature. So, yeah, here is the adolescent program really, really working on their uh, project. Judy? Yeah, so a strong, strong individual character aims, aids in building a strong community. And that is the ultimate goal, not only to build that strong community, but to build it with each person that's a part of that community um, having established a really um, a strong sense of who they are so that they feel that connection to the community and they support it uh, as, as a whole. So as a child feels stronger in their abilities, they'll be able to support this, this community and make it, make it a family, make it close, make it strong. So when you think about this community with elementary children and adolescents, you have to understand and think of their classroom and their school 
as a community. There needs to be an understanding of the need for connections to each other and how they help each other. So it's like, um, it's like that, the, the saying that uh, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So if the, the children in those communities can feel that as, with strength, as we're, if we're all strong, we all help each other, we all support each other, then we are strong. Um, and if we have some areas where we're not, we all work together to build that. And so we're looking from the very beginning at those ideas of reflection. And so from the smallest child thinking, why am I here? How did I get here? Will I always be here? And have I always been here? These are kind of big questions that um, the youngest children really need those opportunities for reflection. And that will be um, everything from giving open time and not setting time limits that break up uh, the ideas of being able to think about things, having space. We have the three hour work cycle in the environment in the morning um, for the early childhood program, at least two hours for the toddlers, infant toddlers, and three hours certainly for the early childhood. And sometimes there will be an afternoon session as well. And in the elementary program, you have morning and afternoon. It's so important that it's uninterrupted by other specials and activities, um, because this is the time that the child really can go into a deep um, mode of reflection. And we see that, as Montessori talked about, after that false fatigue in the three-hour work cycle, that the child falls into a deeper um, level of work and thought and um, really is able to go go deep into what they would like to do. And whether that's a big work in the environment or whether it's just thinking and thoughtfulness. So you see on the image on the left, um, the card in the front says silence. That is a concrete opportunity for the child to choose the work of silence and to just breathe. And when we do activities like yoga or meditation in the environment um, or silence games or sitting in silence, we are showing the child how important that that really is and how to value that. Because unfortunately in today's society, a lot of the time our time is broken up far too much and um, children are not able to really even get to that deeper level of thought. So both time in nature, outdoors and deep breathing and open time and space and being being together being in the moment um, helps us to develop the area of reflection um one thing about reflection um jen is i think that when you lots of times as montessorian teachers mothers whoever we are we we think certain things only can happen in a three to six uh, classroom so in that early childhood classroom, but it's really important to build this into the elementary environment and for adolescents. And I know that silence can be um, a challenge. And so you have to make it um, a game where we're all going to be silent. You can do it as a whole class. You can see how long the class could actually be silent. They love that game but it makes them really become centered and listen. So it's a great way to talk about building our listening skills because we're listening for any noise that anyone makes. So you're, you're just like we work on concentration with the materials in the environment, we have to build their ability to concentrate on different types of reflection. So I wanted to say it's also important in your classrooms or your home to have a space for that, to have a space where if they want that reflection or they want to be silent, they can go there and they can sit or they can just look at something beautiful. Maybe it's in front of a beautiful window looking outside where they're observing um, something that's out that window. I think it's important to take children to um, a place and let them pick a plant, a tree is best, 
uh, that they examine all year round and they have a journal and they name it whatever they want to name their tree. So they go there, they draw a picture at the beginning of the school year of their tree. And then you go there a couple times a month or even more if, you, if it's close and they can record what's happening with the tree. So it's also another way um, for them to reflect changes in nature. Um, also, the other part of that reflection is that you're modeling. You have to model reflection. There are times when children come in the classroom. I was um, in a school yesterday and they're full of energy and the teacher just was taking a deep breath and I could see that she was tired when I went in there and I said, you know, it's the day after here in the States, Easter was Sunday and we don't have a Monday Easter. So it's the day after Easter and the children have been probably had a lovely, exciting three or four days of holiday and they've had a lot of sugar um, for the holiday and been around family. And she said, I know, she said, now that you're saying that to me, I'm just thinking about it. And I thought it was the full moon. <laughs> I said, well, that that together with Easter, if you think about it, is a lot in a classroom. And I said, you know, just remember that. Reflect on what these children have been doing in the last few days. Um, and she's like, and she agreed. She said, you know, I, I didn't think about that. And now I see that, um, why this energy was how it was. So I just want us to remember that there are times when the children will be in the classrooms with us and we are, we're finding our peace in the moment, but sometimes it's, it can be difficult. So we have to model that inner peace. And if that means becoming silent and just observing or just finding a quiet spot ourselves, or saying, I'm going to go out and I'm going to look at my tree because I need that space. But when you model, they will follow everything that you share with them. So who am I and how do I fit in the big picture? So as we leave the, the younger children, this is really where we go uh, with elementary. They really are trying to find exactly where they fit in that big picture. So here's a quote, life in the open air, in the sunshine, and a diet high in nutritional content coming from the produce of neighboring fields improve the physical health while the calm surroundings, the silence, the wonders of nature satisfy the need of the adolescent mind for reflection and meditation. So that's from childhood to adolescence. One um, important aspect for children in an adolescent Montessori environment or any environment, but I know Montessorians do it more regularly, is adolescent students need to have the opportunity to, um, to journal or to sit in nature by themselves. They don't have to have the adult as nearby as younger children do. They need to experience nature and have time for their, there's so much going on in their bodies. So they need for you as the person that's working with them to allow them an opportunity to reflect. So I know that I um, have done adolescent training and I know it's part of a Montessori environment that they do that every day, that they get that opportunity to reflect um, either on themselves, on nature and experience. So we have to always work towards that. So starting with the youngest child to the oldest, um, and we're working on developing that inner spirit. Uh, so we have the self image we're working on. We support them in finding out who they are, uh, we, they want to know where is their place? What's their identity in this community? It could be the classroom, it can be the school, it can be their town, their city, whatever. Um, and then just being conscious of everything around them, the people, the space. Sometimes we have to 
uh, bring that to the forefront because they don't always think of it. Uh, and then the perception, the perception of others that they may have and the perception others may have um, on them. Um, as you were saying, Judy, it's about that modeling, but even if it starts from the beginning with the early childhood program or even younger, um, the children are, uh, there are many moments in the early childhood environment that we have built in that space. So be conscious of that in your environment. When you sing in the morning, your good morning song, when you're, you're welcoming a com the community and just to take a deep breath together, slowly and um, consciously. It, it brings everybody together and it also shows the importance of it. Even presentations, for example, the dressing frames, when we take our fingers and trace gently around the um, outer edge of the frame, that is giving, a, this. it's opening the idea of a deep breath, thinking about what you're doing and taking your time and reflection. And when they're used to that from the youngest ages, then it's, it just develops and continues on as they get older. So um, with community awareness, we're moving into the community. Um, we start with grace and courtesy, um, cooperative learning, communication, and problem solving. So as the child is developing themselves, they're also working with grace and courtesy. That is just seeds at the beginning of peace mm -hmm. education, taking care of one another, how to... Um, how to ask a friend even to work with you, um, just your whole approach to other people uh, in the community and how to, to work together. Mm -hmm. Life in a monastery environment is the education of the social being in addition to the education of the intellect. So as educators, whether it's that you're in your home or it's in a school, you are um, an educator, maybe a mother, we're all, we're educating all the time. Um, but the social being is so important. So if you think about the children that are in your um, care, which whatever home, whatever that is, um, we have to give them opportunity for socializing. Sometimes teachers don't, they say, I don't have time. I don't have time. They need to be working. This happens a lot in uh, in schools that have um, they're more they're not private, so they're more of a public type uh, school, and they have more pressure. But we are missing uh, a huge opportunity if we don't allow it. So this is just as important as math and reading when they're socializing. They're working to find their place in their community. They're developing the necessary skills for life um, for later. So in as they progress through their schools or their university, um, they get into a workplace. Uh, they We like for them in elementary, and I think Jen will talk about the younger ones, but we'd like for them to work in pairs or to work in small groups and then in large groups um, because this helps them for what the future will ask of them. So organizing themselves, uh, sharing, they love to talk about themselves, but you have to allow that in your environment. So whether that's on uh, a circle time, a meeting, morning meeting, afternoon meeting, um, let them do it. Let them talk with their friends. This will lead to the comfort of who they are and how they will eventually have the necessary skills uh, for the future to interact with others. And you can see just by the interaction of the child looking at in the, the image to the left, um, that small child looking, they're automatically from the very beginning, they're learning from their environment, they're adapting to the environment, and they're also learning through the relationships that are being created, um, both in the physical, but also the living in uh, relationships. So just how to interact with others, all of this is happening from the very beginning, and they're in a constant state of adaption, um, adapting to all of those special relationships. And also 
even starting with the three to six environment, going out and taking care of your community and finding out what your outer community needs. What are the things that they could do to help in the community? And that, of course, goes all the way up through elementary and adolescent. But how do we contribute to our community? What are our roles and our human task to um, that we should be looking at environmental needs, for example, in the community. Um, and, and that will lead, of course, to environmental awareness. Um, what could be a, a food drive, for example, that somebody is going to be collecting food for people who, who need food? Um, how can we help the hospital, the fire department, um, picking up trash on the street, putting everybody with gloves and then sorting it in the end to see how we should be sorting um, all of the trash that you can find. So there are many, many opportunities to be able to support the community as well, the outer community and the inner community of the school. So we're going on to uh, talk about global awareness. Again, the key here with global awareness is going to be um, is going to be grace and courtesy, caring for others, gratitude, cosmic education, cultural exchanges, diversity appreciation, and of course, studying the United Nations and all the projects that are in the United Nations. So when we look at um, United Nations sustainability goals, those 17 goals can be broken down, often divided into these peace, er peace awareness areas. And looking at all of the great work that is taking place and having the children become aware of that work. So there are many activities one can do to integrate global awareness into your classroom from specific studies of a country or a continent um, to festivities, um, different types of um, fun activities like making flags, creating uh, festivals. There are many, many practical activities that could be integrated. Did you wanna to add to that, Judy? I do. I think it's really um, important when you have children in that 6 to 12 age range that you, um, two things. The first one is, yes, when we're studying and we're studying different areas around the world that they get to pick um, from continent studies, maybe the way that I, I believe that if you're studying one continent, everyone picks an area or a country. So then you have a whole continent study um, that they present, the children present to themselves, to other people in the school and their parents. They do the flags, the clothing, but most important is the food. Children love food, so do adults, and allowing them to prepare. Um, I used to look up the recipes and I the children would pick them for their country and with the parents' support or help if they could they would prepare a food and bring it in. And now that we don't have to worry about COVID as much, I think we can get back to these type of activities that then bring in actually the whole idea of we're the same, but we're different. And they love to taste the food. I do too, and I think you would too. And um, if, if children are given a month time to study the country, and then bring in the food or any other artifacts and share. That is how we're building our global awareness. And that is how that we are working towards developing children that have a deeper understanding of others. And then um, the kindness that can come out of that. There are many different ways to um, bring in the culture and global awareness to our communities. What we do is in our um, five environments or classrooms, we have uh, a different child that we support from an SOS children's village. And so each um, each environment has a different continent, a child from a different continent. And so that environment is responsible for doing the research and making presentations. And so um, that is something that is an ongoing work because you're helping others and mm -hmm. they have to come up with ideas to raise money. Uh, and that could be baking, selling artwork. There are many different ideas that come up, but it's up to the children to create the ideas. And then they're constantly at work to try and knowingly 
help someone else. And so Mm -hmm. there are so many different projects that can happen um, that just support global awareness. And it should be ongoing as part of your work throughout the year. So also um, in regard to cultural awareness, sometimes we think of um, what is at the core. So the core of a human being is that commitment, compassion, connectedness, and coexistence. Sometimes people feel like they really know someone just because they know their work or their background or income. All of those things are the external things about a person. But the more you get to know someone, you come to that smaller circle that you see here that is really representing interconnectedness of humans. And that's where you want to get when you're studying global awareness. You want to get to that point of truly um, the interconnectedness of all humans, because the other things, they're not as important. Age, ethnicity, physical abilities, all of this gender and race, this is this is not the core of humanity. The core of humanity is where that commitment and compassion is. So that's something just to keep in mind. So um, the celebration of culture, as Judy said here, the children are making spring rolls and that's a tricky, tricky task, I have to say. And so the older children are teaching the younger children. And there are many different activities that we've made that are um, based on Montessori materials, but just to uh, for children to sort with the different continents. There are numerous different activities that you can use your creativity to create that support the materials. And when they are moving their bodies and um, making food and being participants in the celebration of another culture, it's really creating an experience that will stick with them. It's planting those seeds that are so necessary for gratitude and care. I, I agree. I think we do the same thing in elementary, um, just might be a little bit more uh, a higher level of challenge for the children, but giving them the opportunity to work with materials in the class. I love it when they share with each other. I feel that we welcome the parents or the families in to share their cultures. And I think that um, brings a sense of pride to the child. It also gives a child that sense of place, of um, Mm -hmm. connecting to who they are and where they're from, but where they are now. Um, And then we, we do all the same things in three to six, but just at a higher level. So um, in the adolescent program, it's mostly adolescents. It can go down um, to fifth grade, actually, or what would mm-hmm. be considered fifth grade. Um, the Montessori Model United Nations program, the whole organization is absolutely an amazing experience. So um the adult, the adolescents are able to choose on their own what country they would like to represent. And then um, they work the entire year to be able to learn everything about it, all of the, the geography of the area, the economic situation, the challenges and the struggles. They learn how and try to problem solve so that they can um, stand up and actually stand for that country. And then they come to the United Nations and they are given the opportunity. They wear a suit, they are professional, and it's really giving them a dynamic experience to be just like a United Nations um, meeting. So I'd like to, uh, I'm just going to share one video, uh, a small clip, which many could be found, uh, of course, but this is a short clip of some of the students' experience. From the Philippines and we represent Australia. I'm from Canada and I represent Kazakhstan. I represent South Sudan on both the topics of biodiversity loss and climate change, two really deep topics, and I am from California. I like um, the country's president, Evo Morales. I think um, he is a risk taker and an inquirer, and he um, managed the country well. South Sudan has a lot of ethnic com- um, conflicts. Yeah, and it's also suffering from climate, a uh, lot of climate change. Do you come here with uh, lots of propositions or? Yes. Yeah. So you think you will find a solution? 
Yes, I learned Molly has a lot of problems with racism. Zakshan has been through a very big developing stage, and in my committee, which is the Security Council, we're talking about uh, the Great Lakes region, and actually, interestingly, Kazakhstan is very similar to the situation with the Great Lakes, and we've already had that situation done. So I'm looking forward to talking with the other delegates. Something interesting about Sudan, South Sudan, is that. Well, I just, hmm, well, everything is interesting in my opinion about South Sudan. I don't really have something that's like super interesting oh. because everything is super interesting to me. Okay. It's a developing country. It's my second conference. I went to China. It's my first conference. My second. I've been to China. Have you ever been in Italy before? Yes. yes. I've been to Rome one time. Uh, no, it's my first time. The experience that they receive as delegates is so dynamic and um, it's in New York and in Switzerland and in Rome uh, they have these huge delegations and they learn in such a practical sense that it gives them a, an experience that they would never be able to have by just reading it in a book or or understanding in that way so it's a multi-sensory experience. So let us give the children a vision of the universe. So this is actually just the core of what uh, we're doing. And being a part of the universe is also the development of um, the spirituality. And when you look at this picture, you, you have to know that this world is amazing. Um, so it brings us to environmental awareness. Mm -hmm. So we're finding our place within this wonderful planet and really showing our care and, and love and gratitude for everything that we have that's here and seeing our likenesses. Something that's very important is that we see when we look at a tree and we present it to the child, we are showing the bark on the tree. That's like the skin that we have, the veins that we have, just like branches on the tree. We're making those connections every time that we have the opportunity. And that is part of our cosmic awareness and cosmic thinking that also gives the child a deeper feeling of appreciation. So oftentimes it is not creating some huge new presentation. It is about our specific and thoughtful and conscious awareness when we are presenting um, everything that we present and particularly in nature. So when we look at some of the people like David Orr, Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, these are people who are working in cosmology and working with ecology to develop an awareness of the next period and being aware of our place in the universe. So discoveries have been made that suggest that we move now into an ecozoic period, which will be an, a period where humans will become more aware of their role and their task for ecology and for caring for the planet. And so that will include gratitude, engagement, empathy, and sustainability. These are important elements that we have to have moving forward. And how do we develop that gratitude with um, the students that we're with is that the first thing we do is we model it. Um, so every day you work on gratitude and uh, when you're with children, it's about um, appreciating the positive and accentuating the positive and being grateful so when we look outside and it's raining, we're so thankful it's raining today um, because the plants are getting their needed water. Because, you know, children will be like, oh, we don't get to go outside. We can't, or, you know, it's raining too hard. We can't be outside today on the playground. So turn that around and make it something that you're thankful for. Um, same thing with uh, other types of weather or if something happens that children can't be at school, well, that wasn't good that we couldn't be at school, but we're thankful that everyone is okay. So different, the perspective with children, if you make it a positive perspective and being thankful for what we 
can celebrate instead of talking and focusing on the negative, then we're helping to build um, their awareness of gratitude um, and then engaging them, like Jen said, outside with nature, everything, really stop, get down to the child's level. Uh, as an adult, we tend to be bigger, taller, and we don't always sit in, the, sit in the grass and really just look at the leaves that are blowing around us or look at the roots of the plants next to us on the ground. And then Jen and I were talking about empathy and um, empathy is something that has to be practiced in a way that children understand what it means to be empathetic. They don't, it's not always natural. So we have to talk about it, bring subject up of how do you feel for someone else? How does, how do, how does that feel when something happens, when there's a disagreement or argument, we ask them, how did that make you feel? And then we ask the other person, oh, how do you think your friend was feeling? What do, you, what, what do you want to say? How do you feel when your friend doesn't feel good? Um, and then working on sustainability in our classrooms. Uh, we recycle, we reuse. You can ask families to donate papers or diff, you know, old paper their company might not be using. A lot of ways that we can get children to understand that uh, we reuse and recycle um, to help our planet. One of the things I wrote down for um, you to do, and I actually um, got it out of Eileen Wolf's book, and is that when you have a class meeting with children, ask them, how did I help the earth today? and get them to really think about it. Well, they might say, I turned off my lights last night because there was enough light in my bedroom to read a book, or I didn't let the water run while I was brushing my teeth. Um, just different ideas. And you could create a class book where children could actually enter how they helped the earth and maybe draw a picture. And over time, you will have a nice, um, a book made by the children that they could read and give themselves, each other, more ideas. So again, it's modeling and helping them to think of ways to connect to the earth and to help our earth. Hmm. And these are all also areas that you can really help uh, get help from parents in parent education. So you can really help them to understand so that you're all, we're all supporting that same goal. Especially when we're thinking about outdoors and how important it is to be outdoors so that um, parents understand how important it is to go out in the rain, out in the snow, out in the, yeah, and experience the snowflakes and experience the temperature and the senses and everything and the, the rain falling down, the smells, the tastes, the feeling. So all of that is so um, helpful if parents are supportive and understanding how important this really is for their children. So here we see some adolescents um, and we just wanted to point out that at this level, again, uh, there's a lot happening in the classroom. You can see that uh, the first child, he's moving a ball up and down, um, and that has to do with physics, the laws of physics, making connections. Um, the science that these children do, especially as they get into upper elementary and the adolescent age, everything they do needs to be connected to nature somehow because that experience will be deeper for them, that learning and that knowledge, they will remember it. So practicing the laws of physics, um, or you can see they're looking in the microscope, so they're studying cells. So then where, where do those cells come from? Can we go out in nature and collect different um, specimens and bring them in and look at the different types of cells? So making the connections mm -hmm. after they've studied what's needed in the areas around them. So again, the children have to experience what you're teaching them in the classroom, but then they need to be able to apply it to real life because then it is something they will remember and they will be able to talk about it and they have learned it. 
So Montessori said, abandon the schoolroom and open the gate of life. So let the children out and let them explore and trust that they're going to discover what they need to discover. Um, I think we want to just leave you with the idea behind when you're with the children and your goal is to help them to build that inner spirituality, their inner spirit, and making all of these connections um, culturally, socially, globally, um, and then environmentally. If you can do all that and allow the children to build their trust in you, so you're giving your trust to them in what they're doing, then you're helping them to become that spiritual, peaceful person. And that is what's needed in our world. And that is the work that we do. So we encourage you to really think about how you're with the children every day. And even sometimes before you respond to them, um, step back, trust them to be able to do things that we would do for them maybe, or we might tell them how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, let them ask you for help. Thank you for your lovely comments. Is there anybody who had any questions?